So thank you for the kind opportunity, Dr. Shiva, to meet you here in Rome. First of all, how come you are in Italy? And above all, how come you started from Sardinia on your tour? It's a good question. I've been to Italy, the mainland here, probably about seven times. But I've always wanted to go to Sardinia for a number of reasons. First of all, just seeing the beauty of it, just from an aesthetic standpoint. But the other is Sardinia, I think, is in a very unique position geographically. I mean, it's in a very strategic position, if you think about it, that has served U.S. imperialism and NATO imperialism for, unfortunately, too long. But it's also a place, from a medicine standpoint, that has a history of longevity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my background, interestingly enough, always has intersected politics and medicine. Yeah. And so... To me, Sardinia intersects both of those, and the fight for truth and freedom, and the desire to really understand health. You may know that I grew up in India, where India had a caste system. I grew up in an indigenous traditional system, and I was fascinated as a kid to understand why these inequities existed. But I also grew up in a world where my grandmother was a, the local village shaman. She was the one who people called upon to heal them. So I was fascinated by medicine. You see, so the intersection was always health, medicine, and truth and freedom, which is trying to understand why there's systems of oppression. In many ways, Sardinia, which I didn't know to the extent, is also the intersection of both. I had come here on the interest to really understand as a biologist, as a systems biologist, as someone who's studied health for most of my life, to understand there's people have written about these things called quote-unquote blue zones, Sardinia having the longest, the most highest number per capita people who would live over 100 years. And it's a very interesting isolated culture in some ways, but it also has a very rich history, which has unfortunately been hidden. So those are the things that made me really want to come to Sardinia. And I learned a lot on this trip, particularly how U.S. and NATO imperialism has been taking advantage of the island and the people, and also the rich history of people wanting to resist and fight back. So... That's Is this a European tour or just Italy and Sardinia? Well, my intention was, you know, we have a movement that we've created, a global movement for truth, freedom, health. And we shall we, talk about it. Yes, and we realized that I've always felt that I've been looking for a place because for Europe, which can be sort of a meeting point. And Sardinia looks like it may be that location. And we want to do more conferences here because it's sort of an interesting area people probably want to get inspired to come to. And it's also sort of in the center of East and West in many ways. Okay. So the second question is, you have recently announced that you are running as an independent in the 2024 president elections. Why not with the Republican, given that in both 2017 and 2020, you ran for the Massachusetts Senate as a Republican candidate? Well, first of all, in 2017 and 18, when I ran for U.S. Senate, I wanted to run as a Republican. But the Republican Party and the Democrat Party are actually one party. Man. They're a uniparty. And you would have thought that the Republican Party, which claims you know, the ethos of meritocracy that they're into, they define themselves as people who work hard, bottoms up. Well, it turns out that there is no such distinction, that, especially in Massachusetts. If you think about Massachusetts, where the first shot was fired, you know, to start the American Revolution, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, in many ways, when that revolution took place, it's not like the British got up and left after they lost. In fact, they entrenched themselves more in, in Massachusetts, if you think about, you know, Harvard's there, etc. And so what's happened is the left and the right, in many ways, they're actually completely one in Massachusetts. But uh -huh. in Massachusetts, they portray as though they're different. And this is part of something we should discuss more as we get into this interview. But the reality is that when I ran, you would have thought, I never wanted to, by the way, ever run for electoral politics. I've always been a builder of movements since I've been a 17-year-old kid, bottoms up. I do not believe that you can win top down, even if you want to win these positions for the kind of positions I take. Politically, you have to have a movement. So we decided to run because it was an interesting time. Donald Trump had announced he was going to run, and it seemed globally as well as nationally, working people were looking for anti-establishment forces. And I believe that Donald Trump or his advisors or whoever you want to say controls him were aware of this. 
So that's why they dropped him in, and he spoke a lot of the anti-establishment rhetoric. But the reality was he's not anti-establishment. If anything, he's fully part of the establishment. So when I ran, we ran against a woman called Elizabeth Warren, who's, a, who's the sitting senator from Massachusetts, but she got her position at Harvard, where she's a professor, by claiming she was a Native American. Right. Okay? And uh, now, my run against her was not to expose the issue of race, which she took advantage of, but the issue of integrity. And so... Real we, Indian and not fake. Yeah, so, so we made a great... I, I would say it's probably one of the best ad campaigns in political history. Well, nice. We call it only the real Indian can defeat the fake Indian. We had a picture of me with her. Yeah, yeah. And people just loved it. Yeah. And the city of Cambridge tried to take down our banner, mm. saying we were violating some random law. I sued them in federal court and we won. The interesting thing is the Republican establishment ran an idiot against her because they have no intention of winning. You see, it's all about backroom deals are made. And this is what people need to understand. In fact, they ran a guy who photoshopped a picture with Trump, fake handshake, oh, yeah. yes, to convince people that he was a Trumper. And so, because, you know, the pro-Trump movement was there. So anyway, so we ran as independents. So to just correct you, in 2017, we ran as independents. In 2020 is when I said, okay, I'll give the Republicans a shot. I ran as a Republican. Yeah. And that's when we discovered serious election fraud in the entire system. And it was our campaign which exposed this long before Trump. In fact, Trump used a lot of our stuff and raised about half a billion dollars. And I can talk to you later and I have two meetings with him because he was all excited to, of the work I'd done. But at the end of the day, we ran initially as an independent, and then we ran as a Republican. It was the Republicans who colluded with the Democrats to commit election fraud on me. Right. So I don't, both parties are two heads of the same serpent. Okay. Then straight to the point, your chances of being elected are infinitesimal. Why then the investment of money and commitment? Yeah, so let's look at your question. First of all, let's look at why you're asking that question. And I want to sort of dissect that. First of all, when a human being, any human being in the modern world comes to a point where they decide that they want, they don't accept the world the way it is. Status quo. Yes. So you have two sets of human beings. Some people accept the way the world that it is and are fine say, well, the world sucks and I can't change it, so I'm going to maintain my own little garden here and you know, I'm going to live in quiet desperation. Or people go to the other extreme where they may do terrorist activities, right? But once people get beyond that and they say, yes, I want to do, change the world, what are the two options that the establishment gives them? One is you can file lawsuits, you can get involved in the court system, something is in, has happened to you that's not correct. So you, they encourage you to find a lawyer, and file lawsuits. That's one vehicle. The other is they say, well, why don't you write to your congressman, right? You know, run for office, electoral or legalistic. So these are the two options a typical, the average person is given. Now, in 1981, when I was a, about 17 years old, when I first came to MIT, I was very interested in politics since I was a four-year-old kid, since I grew up in this caste system. And you may remember at that time, Ronald Reagan was running for office, as well as Walter Mondale, Republican and Democrat. And there was a third candidate running called Jesse Jackson. Yeah. Now, Jesse Jackson claimed he was building a movement, called it the Rainbow Coalition. And a number of activists like myself were, oh, maybe something will happen here. But at the end of the day, on the evening of the Democratic National Convention, Jesse Jackson basically says, well, you know, we have to choose the lesser of two evils. And he gives all of his votes to Walter Mondale. And I haven't confirmed this. The rumor was that he was offered a private jet for doing this. Okay. So what I recognized as a kid was that the establishment is very clever. They have these two wing, two oh. shoulders. So if the head of the is one, they have the Republican and Democrat obvious establishment, like today's world, it's like the Hillary Clintons and the Obamas in the United States and Democrats. And on the right, you have people like Mitch McConnell and those kind of people. But the establishment has gotten much more clever over the last hundred years. They've also don't only have the shoulders, but they have the wings. So on the left, they have people like AOC, 
Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or in the old days, Jesse Jackson or Bernie Sanders, who'll bark at their own democratic establishment. But they just do that just enough to manipulate people to think they're fighting against the establishment. And like Jesse Jackson did at the last minute, they'll always say, well, you gotta, we have to choose the lesser of two evils. And you can see that Bernie Sanders did the same thing. You know, in the 2016 election, he said a lot of stuff against Hillary at the last minute. He said, well, we have to support her. Yeah. And I had many friends who said, oh, Bernie will never do that. I said, mark my words, he's gonna do that. And then on the other wing, the right wing had the Tea Party at one point, but they needed a new person to rile up the right, and that's the role of Donald Trump. So in short, if I would, would understood, even if you have no chances, you have the moral duty to do this. this well, is the... it's more deeper than that. So once you understand this dynamic, you recognize that every two to four years, the establishment has gotten very clever at taking the broad mass of people and diverting them that their citizenship is about voting on this one day. And after that, you go back to watching football <laughs> or in the old days, watching the, going to watch gladiators in the Coliseum, right? So they've created this very defined moment where they use that moment to make people think they have a civic duty. Now, I'm a big, not only a believer, but from a scientific and engineering standpoint, when major changes occurred, it's always been bottoms up movements, yeah. period. So my view is it's very strategic. Now put it to you this way, for a guy like me, who has all my degrees at MIT, who is clearly has very clear positions and platforms and solutions, but I'm not part of the left and the right and I'm independent. There's absolutely no way that if I ever joined either party, that I could even ever get my ideas out because you always have to compromise in that electoral process. However, if someone like me ever wanted to win, the only way to do it would be through building a movement. You'd have to have a movement, okay? So our goal in running at this important historical point is that I've created now probably three, 400 million people all over the world know about Dr. Shiva and the Truth, Freedom and Health brand because they know They saw what I did in 2020. They saw what I did in 2021. I was the first one to call out Fauci. So I've built a tremendous awareness. awareness and also people know they can trust me. I'll always call out the bullshit long before others will, because I'm not an opportunist. I actually want to see the world change. So because of that, we have a unique opportunity. Running for president gives us this very unique opportunity in history, given the following that I have to expose the left and the right with uncompromising exposition. So if you notice, I was the first guy to expose Elon Musk recently, since December. I so I was the first one to expose Robert Kennedy. This guy is a fake. The Kennedys as a whole are a fake. They're a mythology. I was the first one to expose Fauci when it was not popular. I was the first one to expose the election for systems fraud. I was the one who discovered in my own lawsuit that the government has a backdoor portal in Twitter. So I built a huge following of people who say, this guy will always tell us the truth. So if I even wanted to ever win president with my values, there's no way I could do it without building a movement. So this running for president is going to do two, two things. First, it's going to educate lots of people about the fact that the left and right screw you every day, Democrats and Republicans. And the other thing is we're going to explosively grow our movement. So we win anyway. We already won with all the work I did in 2020. We already won with all the work I did in 2021 because we've raised human consciousness. And it is about raising consciousness, period. Okay. In very few lines, because it's with your movement, Truth, Freedom, Health, what is your election program regarding healthcare, economy, and war? Yeah. So what we've done is our platform, uh, we actually have six areas that we're going after, but let me just answer yours. It's clear that our position on healthcare is very simple. If you look at the United States lifespan, starting in 1980, the rest of the world is going like this, mm -hmm. the United States is going like this. Now, no one is talking about this but me. And if you look behind that curve, why the United States line is going like that, it is not any one issue. It's a systems issue. But if you go down to the simple biology of it, it's one simple answer. We have to enable people to strengthen their immune systems. So that's me talking as a systems biologist, as an engineer, 
as someone who's an activist. So our entire healthcare program is simple. Let's boost people's immune system. Now we're not gonna wait for government to do that because the entire government process is completely corrupt. So what we're doing is we're, we, when we go door to door every once, every six Thursdays, we actually teach a course online free. So we're not gonna say, we're gonna do this when we get elected. No, we're actually gonna, we actually teach people what is the immune system as I did in 2020. We teach people how you can protect your immune system and how you boost it. And as a part of that, we talk about the economics and the politics around that. Because ultimately you have to give people something very tangible to do here and now. So between now and 2024, just like in 2020, we saved millions of people's lives with the protocols I put out. We're gonna teach people that, but in a much more larger framework. So the health care is if you go down to it, lifespan is going down in the United States. None of these presidential candidates care about the human suffering of people. And ultimately, we are the only ones who are going to give people a solution here and now. So that's our quote unquote platform. So our platform isn't just a platform on healthcare, it's actually delivering something here and now. The next question you asked about was what? On Economy government. and war. So if you look at the, let me talk about war, okay, first. US imperialism is based on expanding its markets. And today, the elites in the world, it's not they're even loyal to a country anymore. They're everywhere. And so my view is on war, the United States should pull out of NATO, number one. It's an old institution that should not even exist anymore, in my view. And many, many people agree with me on this. On war, I've always been an anti-war activist. You can go look back in 2007 when I was getting my MIT PhD, I was the first one to say we should get out of Iraq. Since I was a kid, I organized some of the largest protests against the Iran, you know, the Contra wars, etc. So I've been an anti-war ground activist most of my life. So that's my position on war. On the position on the economy, fundamentally what's going on is during the pandemic, 600 billionaires increased their wealth by $2.3 trillion. Uh, Obama printed $8.1 trillion, Trump printed $6.2 trillion. And it's during the pandemic when Elon Musk made all of his money. The printing of money the United States is able to do for one singular reason, because it is the reserve currency. Yep. And it doesn't have to pay anything for that. Other countries' dollar or the other countries' currency gets deflated. And in fact, the latest theory, which is by a woman called Stephanie Keating, who is Bernie Sanders' theoretician, she says, print as much money as you want. Don't worry about it. That means you're basically saying you want to promote U.S. imperialism. Because the only way the United States can print as much money as it wants is as long as it's a warmongering country, right? Because without the war machine, the United States doesn't have any access to its reserve currency. But ultimately what it's doing to the American public is the goal is to move citizens. Ultimately, this is going to force the Fed to move everyone to digital currency. Because what's going to happen is today the U.S., let's say, has $35 trillion dollars in debt, you take 4% of that, which is going to be about $1.5 trillion or $1.8 trillion, that is 25% of the entire U.S. budget. Now, when that hits $60 trillion or $70 trillion, my theory is the Fed is basically going to go to all these banks and say, you know what? We can't pay you. Here's digital currency. They're just going to make up money. And then all these people that they've put on welfare and that they've, who's economies they've destroyed, they're just going to give people money, which is going to be digital currency. That digital currency will be on the iPhone, which will be completely controlled Control. and it'll be centralized. Right. So you'll have this triangle of centralized digital currency with control on this, and they're going to merge in carbon credits. A small company in the United States was funded $2 billion to create the exchange for digital currency and carbon tax. Now, no one's talking about this. I was the first one to expose this. So as a technologist, you can see the merger of the government back to our censorship infrastructure with digital currency with carbon tax. Now, if you look at any of these other candidates, all of them support one or all of those. Yeah? Yeah. Great. Fifth question is pretty long. You were running for the position of CEO of Twitter but Elon Musk nominated Linda Yaccarino yeah. instead. I saw that you insulted Musk on Twitter. Multiple times. Call him a scumbag. Yeah. And claim that he, Tucker Carlson, Donald Trump, 
and Robert Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. are all deep state pricks. Even though, for an example, Robert Kennedy Jr. shared the same position as you regarding the pandemic and was very active in fighting the lies of Fauci and the global establishment in the biggest scam of the century. Moreover, you also claim that people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King were created as false gods to stop independent movements of people. The question is, in short, Dr. Shiva, no one is exempt. No, so let's talk about this. This question is probably the most important question. My entire life history as an engineer, as a scientist, has been to understand how you achieve human liberation. This is a very fundamental question. I know. And throughout the history of human beings, there was a time when people thought we could never have light. There was a time when people thought we could never fly. Right? Yeah. Am I right or wrong? Right? Right. But it was the development and the understanding of engineering systems principles, Bernoulli's principles, for example, which allowed us to achieve flight. Or if you think about Newton's equations, which allowed us to build structures like this, right? Over and over again. When it comes to human liberation, liberating people for good, truly ending exploitation of man by man, the thesis in many people's brain that has been brainwashed repeatedly is, well, human beings by nature are bad. You know, you cannot have a just society. Just move along, right? Or you have to accept scumbags like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. or so on. And we'll get to this. When you study system science, there is a science to liberating people. And it is the same science that is involved in understanding engineering principles. You see, we live in a world of systems. When Marx wrote Das Kapital, or Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, they didn't have access to engineering systems principles because these principles weren't around. So they made some hypothesis. Some of the observations that Marx made were right on target, particularly his aspect of how the forces of production affect human consciousness. When you go to Lenin, Lenin advanced that in certain realms and he got other things wrong. So the Bolshevik revolution in its early part was very successful for about two years, I'd argue, okay? So these people, these theoreticians have been trying to figure out, and you can't blame them. Typically, the Western elite intellectuals blame them. Oh, they, were, they personalize it. But I've studied this from an engineering standpoint. I've studied all great revolutionaries. And the conclusion is that it was only in the early 1950s that the science of systems really came to be with the work of Ilya Pergroni, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. So as an engineering systems person, I have been fascinated by how change occurs, be it in thermodynamic systems, small systems, large systems, biological systems. And it was during my Fulbright work that I was able to realize that there are nine principles in engineering systems principles. And in fact, those same principles match one-to-one -one with ancient systems of medicine. So when you step back, every system in the universe can be seen as a system composed of these nine principles. Those nine principles, one of those important principles of intelligence systems is every intelligence system has a goal. And in the pursuit of that goal, I don't have time to go into all the details of this today, but we teach people this in our movement, that one of the things that come in the way of achieving a goal is a disturbance. That disturbance in your life, you want to lose weight, could be you have friends who say eat pizza and drink beer all day. You have to figure out how to focus your efforts, right? Or if you're trying to do anything in life. You know, an airplane is flying, it has different disturbances. In political systems, there are such disturbances. The goal, in my view, is truth, freedom, and health. Now, truth, freedom, and health, when you analyze this, these three words are not simple words. Freedom, what is freedom? Freedom is the ultimate movement of information, matter, and energy. That principle has existed in ancient systems of medicine, was called Vata. In the engineering principles, it's called transport. Then you look at another principle. So freedom is essential to existence. Another concept is called the conversion principle. Your body takes food and it digests and it converts it. In the Indian system, that was called pitta. In this world, the truth is a refinement process that comes out of practicing the scientific method. You have all sorts of ideas, you practice the scientific method, you get to truth. But you can't get to truth if you don't have freedom, 
right? Because without open discourse, you can never achieve great science. What is health? Health is the vessel which contains all the, if you're not healthy, you cannot fight for freedom, you cannot fight for truth. The same principle exists in the engineering principles, it's called storage or structure, which contains transport and conversion. That is called Kafka and Avian system. So, very simply, I have figured out these fundamental principles. Now, when you apply it to political science and political history, you find out something quite compelling. Over the last thousands of years, like we saw in Rome and places like here, thousands of years ago, those in power, when they saw bottoms up movements coming, they just destroyed them, right? Forcibly. Fascism just hammered them. But over the last 200 years, the establishment has become far more clever. They've created a different way of disturbing those people who want to be on the track to truth, freedom, and health. Whenever they see a bottoms up movement coming up, and nowadays they can see this in microseconds with social media. People like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk have technologies which know the overall sentiment of people. And with that understanding, the establishment started creating the not so obvious establishment. This is an engineering force. In India, there was a bottoms up movement and you should study the works of Ramakrishna Mukherjee, who, you know, wrote The Rise and Fall of the East India Company or many of the great theoreticians. You'll find in the 1920s, the Indian people wanted a good revolution, potentially a violent one. It's up to them to do what the American Revolution was about. And that mercantile revolution was building and Gandhi was parachuted in. I mean, this guy's a racist. Go look at his history. He wasn't fighting for the poor Hindus and the poor blacks in South Africa. He was fighting for the wealthy merchants in the Transvaal region. And at the time Gandhi was coming in, so if you really go into it, there was a fervent revolutionary movement. And what the British and Gandhi colluded was they created the Indian National Congress. They didn't want people building a bottoms up movement. So for all these brown people, they created a little Congress. And they said, okay, you guys go in here and argue it out. It was a safety valve. And Gandhi was allowed to traipse all around India and promote a ridiculous philosophy of that it's good to get your, to be beaten up. And it was made into some form as though people enjoyed being beaten up and this was something spiritual. When the reality was what he actually served doing in India was to ensure there was a transfer of power took place. The British actually wanted to leave India. They were ready to leave and transfer power to the Indian elites. In fact, $5 billion more investment occurred after the British left. Gandhi's role was to support that transfer of power. So he appointed Nehru, who was sleeping with Mountbatten's wife, okay? These people are all part of the same thing. So white men with crowns leave India and brown men with white hats take over. India never really got rid of the caste system. Gandhi was frankly a casteist. So one must understand that I have a very different perspective on this. And it's to break this illusion of Gandhi was some great hero. He wasn't. He was brought in as a vehicle to make sure this emerging bottoms up movement didn't take place. So this even was, if Gandhi and Martin Luther King were killed, they are not heroes in your opinion. No, they're martyrs that were created by this system. Okay? They are part of that's an epiphenomenon. We have to go back and look at what they actually did at the end of the day. Let's talk about Martin Luther King. If you look at the works of Malcolm X, mm -hmm. and you see, it's unfortunate, but white liberals for far too long have controlled the discourse on change. And it's important that we break through that because there is a bias there. Malcolm X came bottoms up, very different than a Southern Baptist bourgeois preacher, which is what Martin Luther King was. When the civil rights movement was taking place, one of the key solutions was infrastructure in the inner cities. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Their own economic zones. Martin Luther King, again, was brought in to this movement. Malcolm X called the March on Washington a circus. If you go look at Robert Kennedy Jr., we'll get to the Kennedys. I mean, the Kennedys are one of the, you can read the work of Seymour Hersh, one of the <laughs> totally mythologized people. These people were complete mafia. And Robert Kennedy, F. Kennedy, the senior of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., he was bugging all of the civil rights leaders. The entire Southern National Christian Conference and Martin Luther King were promoted. <clears throat> you see, the establishment is very clever again. Smart. They're very smart. So they create and promote the not-so-obvious establishment. And my intention is to expose this because this is a force that is a reason that human advancement has not taken place. Not the obvious establishment, not the Fauci's, but the not so obvious establishment. 
Fauci is easy to point out. Yeah, fact, it's all those history. Right, but this phenomenon is we need to understand this. Yeah. And to me, the litmus test of someone who really so get, well, is for change is that I supported Donald Trump. It's not like I discounted him, I gave him money. I put up more signs than most people who are Trump supporters out in the cold. All right? Michelle and I have met with him. We supported him, but you have to objectively look at what he did. He printed $6.2 trillion. I was the first one to attack Fauci. And we'll get to Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was supporting lockdowns. Go look at his tweet of yeah, March 30th, 2020. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. He waited until October 2021 to write a book. Most of it's plagiarized for my work. Robert Kennedy is the not so obvious establishment. In fact, the entire Kennedy clan is institutionalized not so obvious establishment. And this is the brainwashing that our movement is going to break people from. Elon Musk, I was the first one to call him out, took a lot of heat. You know, when I put out that tweet, the reason I put out that tweet was a test. Hey, I've been fighting for free speech all my life. There's yeah. a picture of me with 40,000 people trying to kill, Michelle was on the stage with me, and John Medlar, 40 of us, because they thought we were Nazis. <laughs> so I know what fighting for free speech is. Elon Musk doesn't. This guy grew up in apartheid South Africa, yeah. okay? We have to break this brainwashing because the establishment is very clever. Right now they're creating a neo-establishment. Tucker Carlson's, grifters, Robert Kennedy, Trump. It's all WWE theater. No different than what used to take place at the Coliseum thousands of years ago. But the good news is our movement exists. They're not gonna get rid of me because I figured them out and we have a broad leadership that we're creating. But the key goal is to remove people from this brainwashing. Yeah. That sure. no change is ever going to come from above. Sure. It's going to come from bottoms up, period. What do you think about the relationship of, the, of Elon Musk and the artificial intelligence? Because sometimes he spoke about it's very favorable for yeah. AI, and the next day he says that can be dangerous as well. So here's the thing we need to understand. Those in power, it's a very important question you're asking, have become so facile at speaking with both sides of the mouth. I mean, it's just, they just do it because they, at the end of the day, hate everyday human beings. They actually, you know, when I used to be in Hollywood, you know, I used to be married to someone out there, right? When someone came for an autograph and left, you know what that person would say? Oh, that's a star fucker. And if you go to Nobu, this one restaurant in Malibu, they all hang out together and they despise everyday people. Yeah. We live there. We met a lot of stars. Right. But these people are mostly idiots, uneducated yeah. people who have golden handcuffs and were prostitutes. Right. So now having seen both sides, I can call them out. And we, they need to be called out with viciousness and harshness. And we do that. I believe you should use the right curse word for the right person at the right time. Now, why is that important? Because people have been brainwashed yeah. to give people this respect. So I do it in a very important strategic way. I'm willing to take the hit on it mm -hmm. because it has to be done to break people from this magical hypnotic, as though these people are some false. To awake. Yes, to awaken people. Yeah. So when I called Elon Musk a scumbag, these words are to break people like he's some genius. What is he saying? He's a government front man. His entire... The richest man in the world. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe He's an not. agent of government. Everything he does comes at the behest of government. Period. And the interesting thing with AI is, you know, I did 20 years of research in AI. The second, separate from when I invented email as a kid, the second life I had with email was I was a guy who won a contest to automatically analyze and route email for the White House. And I created a company for that in customer service. And for 20 years, I did some very groundbreaking work in AI. So all the AI algorithms were pretty similar. But at the end of the day, what you recognize is artificial intelligence could be used for good, but not in the hands of these people. These people want to eliminate human beings and replace human beings. With machines. Or, yeah. or if not machines, if they can enslave people. They're going to make a decision. Is it easier to have a bunch of carbon-based beings that they can reuse and kill quickly? Or do they need silicon-based beings? Yeah. But at the end of the day, artificial intelligence began when Henry Ford created the assembly line. Carbon-based beings were repeatedly told to do a task. And now with modern algorithms and machine learning stuff, you can do this much faster and cheaper. 
So let's do, let's go to the last two questions. In your recent public speech in Sardinia, you said that the task of the life must be to defeat evil. Fight evil. Fight or defeat. Yeah. And this can only be done if people come together independently from below. But you propose to work for, from above. How do you reconcile the, the two? Well, no, I don't propose to work from above. If you go, if you run for president. Well, well let's talk about that, right? Yeah. You, if you win, and you win as an independent movement, that is very, very different than winning from above. You see? Now, this is... Yes and no. It would be revolutionary, actually, right? Now, one of the commitments that you have to do and you have to pay homage to is you have to keep a decentralized bottoms-up movement constantly going, right? So it's, it has to be... The ends and the means cannot be separated. The typical electoral process is, oh, let me, let me get into office. I'm not going to say much. After I get in, I'll do something. Mm -hmm. Because people have been brainwashed to think the ends justify the means. So if you look at how we're running our campaign... We have six very important things on healthcare, environment, education, innovation, etc. All these things. As we're running, every once, every Thursday, we're actually teaching people how to achieve that now. Not after I'm elected. In a decentralized way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So every yes. one of our platforms is something, a living, breathing thing that encourages people to get involved bottoms up. This is quite innovative, right? It's saying that... If it works... Well, it's, well, the reality is the running for office and what we're doing is already, and since 2020, we've already galvanized a movement. So the issue is, what is governance anyway? What is the purpose of a president? What is a president? A president is supposed to be a spokesperson, right? He's supposed to be a reflection of the mass consciousness, in my view. Or That's, a puppet. Or a puppet, right? Or a puppet. The movement here is where the ends and the means are constantly united every microsecond. We're not saying we're going to do this and doing something else. It gives us very interesting opportunity for everyday people to get involved because one of the things we're teaching people is governance. How you have to raise your consciousness, understand the principles of systems, learn, teach, and serve. Mm -hmm. So our entire program is as our campaign's growing, we're going to be having more and more leaders those leaders are going to be encouraged to educate other people and raise their consciousness in this very, very important approach. So we win regardless of whether we actually win a presidential election because we would have raised people's consciousness to start recognizing that the not-so-obvious establishment is a real enemy, which is a huge learning. Think about that. How many people in India... Know, I mean, a lot of the young people know about Gandhi. How many African Americans know that Martin Luther King was really not their hero? How many people know that Elon Musk is a scumbag? As we do this, think about what's going to happen. People are going to say, wait a minute. Dr. Shiva's always, everything he predicted in 2020 has come. And how did he do that? Oh, he understands this very important set of principles. I can learn how to do that. And I think if you look at the United States right now, if people want to live longer, They have to support our movement and vote for me. If they want to die younger, they should vote for any one of, one of the other candidates. It's that simple. Somehow you could say that fighting evil is fighting ignorance. Somehow. It is. Right. And one of the, if you look at my namesake, Shiva, he has this trishula yeah. and he pierces darkness. Yeah. And destroying ignorance is what it's actually about. And I think... Creator and the destructor. Destroyer. But, Destroyer, right. But, but destruction of ignorance is what... To me, that's what evil really is. It's ignorance. Yeah. So by doing this, we're going to win anyway. Because think about how many people... I mean, whenever I travel now, random people come running to me in an airport. Random people. A housewife in Dubai comes running. She goes, I saw your video. Mm -hmm. And I know they stole that election. And I understand this. Thank you for your videos. I get random phone calls from people. Thank you very much. I was about to be admitted to the ICU. I took your vitamin D3. And your, I, you know, so we know we've already saved and helped a lot of people. So now this movement grows. We're, our goal is to have leaders who actually get this and they become teachers and educators. So we see nothing but the option to win everywhere we go. And it's only a matter of time how many people's consciousness we raise. Think about how many nuclear physicists there are. 
maybe a thousand. Mm-hmm. How many people know how to build a nuclear bomb? But one person who knows how to build a nuclear bomb is a billion times more powerful than people who are just cutting wood and burning yeah. fire, right? So our goal is to teach people these principles so they don't get fooled again. Okay. My last question is, your story could have the title From Untouchable Indian to American Prophet, since you claim you have 100% prediction capacity. On what do you base this certainty and who then do you predict will be the next American president? The certainty that I have comes from a couple of important dimensions, right? When you apply these systems principles, you start seeing a recurrent pattern and you can see things. So mm-hmm. the reason I'm able to call out Elon Musk, the reason I'm able to call out Donald Trump or all of these characters, particularly the what I call the entertainment characters, Joe Rogan, all these people, because you can, when you look at it from a system standpoint, you see their interconnections. If you just see them alone as individuals, it's easy to get fooled. But when you see their interconnections, that the fact that Joe Rogan is represented by William Morris Agency Endeavor, right? the fact that Ari Emanuel was the agent for Donald Trump and also the agent for Joe Rogan, you start realizing these people are a swarm of birds, right? It's not like the problem some of these conspiracy theorists have is they try to say, ooh, the center of power is this individual. They get it wrong. It's more they're a collective swarm. They too are decentralized. So once you understand these principles, it's pretty easy to see this stuff. It's really not that difficult. Okay. Concerning who's going to win the president, I can tell you this, that the trajectory right now is it doesn't matter whether the left or right win. Mm-hmm. Their goal is to have somebody in the left or right win and someone from the left or right will win. However, what they do not understand is that when you actually look at system science, there's something quite powerful. Since the time of Newton, the world became very, very mechanistic. What did Newton actually discover? He discovered these laws of motion. Yeah. Now, the day that Newton figured out those laws of motion, the same day, people said, oh my God, the universe can't be so predictable, it's too much mechanized. So at the same time, religion came because they said, no, there's a God. If the world is so mechanized, it doesn't make sense. So we had this thing with religion and science, right, starting to come. The problem is that the mechanistic view of the universe leads to a point where you think it's just the way it's going to be, right? Because that's because if you can predict the motion of all planets, where that leads to is this is why the amount of data collection that's going on, the surveillance is on this theory that if I collect enough data on you and you, I can predict exactly what you're going to buy, do, etc. But the reality is when you study system science, it turns out that the universe is not mechanistic, that Einstein and Newton actually are an approximation of reality. The truth is the universe is actually in chaos and sometimes it creates mechanistic conditions, which is what we have. And this was what the work of Ilya Pergroni was, okay? So it turns out that one single individual thought, consciousness, can change the world. And this is very important. It's called the small fluctuation, okay? Yeah. Thought form. I mean, you look at the works of... freedom of thought. Yes, but in the reality yeah, is the universe is actually chaotic. Under certain times, it becomes mechanistic. Mm. That is the facts. Because I can get into the more details on this. And this has been something very, very interesting since the second law of thermodynamics that came to be. There was this contradiction in science between the mechanistic view of time and the irreversible view of time, or the reversible view of time, the irreversible view. Pergroni's work essentially bridged this gap. And what it really shows is it is out of chaos order comes to be. So the natural state of all things is actually in a quite an uncertain state that things are not predetermined, that anything is actually possible. And small fluctuations can create very big changes. But this is only from a materialistic point of view. What about spirit? No, 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 it isn't. This is, what's really cool about this approach, it merges heaven and earth. Mm-hmm. It actually intersects this false dichotomy between science and religion. Yeah. And that's what's so powerful about this. The science of systems actually bridges heaven and earth. I mean, think about what I just shared here. If you look at the ancient rishis, when they looked at the body, they didn't see it as molecules or genes. They created what I shared with you. If you look at 
there's a paper I wrote out of my Fulbright work, which literally shows that the systems of yoga and the systems of medicine were together. Yep. But what I've shown, which no one else did this before, is that the principles of that match one-to-one -one with modern engineering systems principles. And the cool thing is I can teach Ayurveda to someone within 30 minutes. Mm. Seriously. Yeah. What happened was the Indian system of medicine and yoga became, again, this top-down guru worship. Yeah. Guy's got vibhuti, he's got a robe, he's got a beard, and you have to bow down to him. And I've democratized that through the work we've done with Truth, Freedom, and Health, or your body, your system. So my entire purpose is that many of these systems of knowledge can be made accessible to everyday human beings. You know, today about 20,000 people know the knowledge of systems. George Soros is a theoretician in it. I used to teach it at MIT. I could have just gone that route, but like Prometheus who brought fire to the earth, what we've done is with the science of systems, we, if you go to our website, Truth, Freedom, Health, you'll see there's everyday people, electricians, plumbers, we're teaching. Mm -hmm. They're getting as much the same knowledge as an MIT PhD. And with that knowledge, they're going to be, and we have enough people with that knowledge, it's sort of, it's going to be game, set, match. That's why I'm confident about this. Because it's ultimately about raising consciousness. Yeah. This is the ultimate goal. It's the ultimate goal. It's the only goal. Yeah. And the only mission in life is to fight evil. Yeah. Regardless of where it takes you. Of because course. there is no other mission. mission. Of yeah. Every life. Every life. Yeah. Whether you lose or you win, you have to yeah, fight evil. It doesn't matter. Yeah, even if you have a small yeah. victory, you have to continue. Everybody in his place. Exactly. Yeah. We don't sit in the Oval Office or in Kremlin. Exactly. We sit here. Right. And this is our duty to right. fight here. For right. This. Okay. So, Dr. Shiva, thank you for your time. Thank you. Great really questions. It was a pleasure. Yeah.